So maybe there's another approach. Like I said before, the Nissen fund application actually creates a whole new one-way barrier. I know the little cartoon makes it look like we're wrapping the stomach around that weak valve and sewing it there and that's tightening up the valve. But that's really not what it's doing. What it's doing is recreating a new one-way valve. So maybe there's a way to do this without recreating a new one-way valve. Specifically, maybe we can augment the weak valve back to normal. By doing this, hopefully we should be able to preserve the normal swallowing and belching functions, as well as maintain the normal anatomy. You know, the Nissen really disrupts the normal anatomy, and that's why we get a lot of the side effects and problems associated with the Nissen. It needs to be minimally invasive, obviously. Um, we also need to make it simple and standardized. Part of the problem with the Nissen over the years um, has been that it hasn't been standardized, and it is not a simple procedure, and because of that, there is a lot of variability in techniques as well as outcomes in regarding the Nissen fund application. So in other words, we gotta make the procedure idiot proof. So, about nine or 10 years ago, two engineers from a small startup company came out uh, and visited with me and my boss at the time, Tom Demeester, um, came with an idea. And that idea was just simply magnetic sphincter augmentation to address this therapy gap, meaning this reflux treatment gap. Well, I was a young faculty member at the time, um, and I'm sitting there with Tom Demeester, who would listen to everybody and anybody, and he was just sitting there scratching his chin, listening to this, going magnets around somebody's esophagus, and I'm like, you know, um, that sounds like an idea, all right, but you know, not one that I'm gonna be signing up for today. I'm sort of standing in the background of him going, I uh, don't do it, don't agree. And I've actually put together a list of the things that I thought in my lifetime were gonna happen before I would be putting magnets around somebody's esophagus. This was one of them. This actually happened just a few years ago. And once it did happen, then lo and behold, I listened a little bit more to Tom Demeester. So what they then explained to me was that magnets were just a little bit different than anything else we could put around the esophagus, such as a, a rubber band or a spring. And with those things, the further out you get them, the more forces of attraction there are. But with magnets, it's quite the opposite. The further apart the magnets get, the least amount of forces they have of attraction. The closer they get, the higher the forces. So what they designed was this little magnetic bracelet. So each magnet is housed in a little titanium case and they're each connected by a little titanium link. Each of these links connecting these individual magnets allows for the device to open and close or actuate, spread apart. And so the idea here was, again, that valve at the end of the esophagus is the culprit. It's weak. And so the idea was to go in there and place the device around the end of the esophagus where that weak valve was. The device is not compressive, it's not squeezing the esophagus closed, but it's resisting the opening of the stomach and that lower esophageal sphincter. The forces of attraction are helping to keep it closed. The forces of a swallow, the force of a belch or a vomit will cause the magnets to spread apart to allow for normal physiologic function. Um, ideally, this would be a laparoscopic placement, a uh, 20 to 30 minute procedure, very limited dissection. We're not gonna alter the anatomy substantially and potentially even make this procedure outpatient. And so this is a short little video clip of placement of a Lynx device, what we're doing here. Uh, this is the diaphragm up here. The spleen is located over here. This is the left cura or the left portion of the diaphragm and we're just creating a space or a little plane between the left cura and the esophagus here. We then go over to the patient's right side. This right here is the liver. This is the right cura. Here we've developed a little bit of a window uh, behind the esophagus. That was the posterior vagus. We're gonna place the device between the posterior vagus and esophagus. Once we do that, we're gonna take this then measuring device, which is, all, is gonna allow us to determine the diameter or circumference of each person's esophagus. Based on that, we choose the right size device. We bring it into the field and we then wrap it around the end of the esophagus. We then attach the two ends together. It's got a little clasp device on it that allows the two ends to hook together. We hook the two ends together and we let it just rest there right at the GE junction or lower esophageal sphincter. 
We should be able to start patients on a regular diet immediately post-op. It's a very limited surgery, so they should be able to go back on regular food immediately. It should allow them to belch, it should allow them to vomit, and ultimately it should decrease the gas and bloating issues that we've seen with the Nissen fund application. Well, how did this device get to market? I think this is worth at least a little bit of a discussion because it's very different than a lot of the other devices out there and a lot of the other procedures out there. I can tell you this, most other procedures and devices come through the FDA through what's called a 510K pathway. And what that is is where a technology piggybacks on top of some other existing technology. And when it does that, it doesn't really have to provide a lot of robust data. Well, that's not the way the Lynx procedure came down and got approval. The Lynx procedure came down at what's called a PMA or IDE, IDE trial. And what that is, is really going through two different FDA-regulated clinical trials. There was first a feasibility trial of 44 patients, and based on the results of that, they got approval to do what's called the pivotal trial. That was 100 patients. Um, the first implant was about February of 2007, and five years later, they received unanimous FDA recommendations and subsequent FDA approval for their device. Um, the results of the pivotal trial, this is also worth pointing out, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. That is fairly unusual and fairly rare for a device-related publication to be accepted and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, both of the trials, the feasibility as well as the pivotal trial, um, had basically the same inclusion and exclusion criteria. Patients were 18 to 75 years old. They had to have GERD symptoms for at least six months. They had to have pathologic GERD based on pH testing. So they had to have a positive pH test. They had to be on daily PPIs and they had to show some degree of symptomatic improvement while on the antacid medications. Um, we did exclude hiatal hernias that were greater than three centimeters, the larger grade esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, and some motility disorders. What was different about this trial compared to a lot of other trials it, is what we didn't look at just symptoms. The primary endpoint of the study was really acid exposure, how much reflux these patients had after the procedure. We also looked at secondary endpoints or symptoms, GERD HRQL, um, as well as medication use or PPI use. The procedure was very uncomplicated, both in the feasibility as well as the pivotal trial. Um, there was really no procedural failures. Um, there was no op or operative complication rate, um, no problems at discharge. Half the patients went home the same day, the other half went home the very next day. Well, the device worked, and there's been numerous different publications uh, on the success rate of the device. This first graphic here is in regards to percent time pH less than four. So that's a measurement of esophageal acid exposure. In all of the studies, patients went in with a very high exposure to esophageal acid, upwards of 11 or 12 percent, which is represented in the dark blue here. Post-implant, patients came down to around three and a half to four percent. All right, that's well within normal limits. We saw that in the pilot study as well as the pivotal study and out in Italy where they've got over 100 patients out almost six years now, saw very similar findings with pH uh, upwards of 8% pre-procedure um, and down around 4% post-procedure. All right, well the pH scores were normalized, but what's important also is whether or not patients were actually feeling any better. And so we looked at that also with what's called GERD HRQL scores. What that is is a questionnaire that goes over how miserable a patient is due to their reflux. The higher the score, the more miserable the patient. So going into each one of these studies, patients were fairly miserable. They had GERD HRQL scores of upwards of 25, 26, which is fairly significant. Post-procedure, which is represented in the light blue here, most patients were down around two and three for their GERD HRQL scores. Um, quite an improvement from pre-op. Um, well, the other thing that's important, obviously, is if patients were able to get off their medications. Uh, again, the Nissen literature will suggest that 30% have to go back on, or maybe as high as 40%. So that was looked at also. By definition, 100% of patients in the study were on proton pump inhibitors. Uh, Postoperatively, out to four years in the pilot study, over 80% of them were able to stop their antacid medications. 
Again, in the pivotal trial, similar findings, 100% were on their medications going into the study, and again, over 80% were able to stop their medications afterwards. Italy's experience and then a European registry of almost 250 patients again shows the same thing. 100% of patients on medications going into the study after Link's placement, that drops down to around 80%. Um, patients also noticed improvement in regurgitation. Um, almost all patients, upwards of 90% of them, had some degree of regurgitative symptoms before implant of the device. Postoperatively, at one, two, and three years, that dropped off significantly, down to around 20%, most of which was very mild in SARS regurgitation. Well, what about my ability to belch and vomit? You told me that was one of the biggest downsides to the Nissen fund application. Well, we looked at that also, and most patients, almost all patients, I'll say, were able to belch and vomit after the Lynx procedure. This top right pie graph here represents what the findings in that. About 97% of the patients could vomit at four years after the procedure. The uh, other pie graph here represents the ability to belch. 97% of the patients were able to belch after placement of the Lynx. The bottom two bar graphs here was sort of a surprising finding. Um, the first of which is the bloating frequency. Almost 40% of patients before we did the Lynx procedure on them reported severe bloating. Bloating is a very common symptom associated with reflux. After you have a Nissen fund application, that bloating goes up to about 70 or 80% of the patients. Their bloating actually worsens in the majority of the patients. Surprisingly, what we found after Lynx placement was the bloating actually improved. So the bloating went from 40% of the patients down to around 15, 10% by one and two years out from the procedure. We also noticed a decrease in flatulence or gas from below. So again, about 35% of patients going into the study had increased flatulence. Post Lynx procedure, that dramatically decreased to down around 15, 10% by two, three, and four years out from the procedure. The main side effects of the procedure have been really temporary and self-limiting. Um, and that's been dysphagia, or difficulty swallowing. With the Nissen fund application, we also see difficulty swallowing. It's pretty much universal. Because of it, we usually send a, a Nissen patient home on liquids for several weeks before sending him home, then on soft foods after that. With the Lynx device, because it is a, a foreign body, it's an implant, it's similar to like a knee replacement. We need to keep that device moving. We need physical therapy for the device. Patients with a knee replacement go home with physical therapy immediately. They don't want that new knee getting stuck in scar tissue. Well, the same thing goes for the Lynx device, all right? The only physical therapy for the Lynx device is going to be eating. And so purposely, we tell patients to go home and eat at least soft, and preferably regular food after the Lynx procedure to get that device to open and close so it heals in naturally. Well, the other thing is that the Lynx can, device can be removed. Um, it's a laparoscopic procedure. It's been taking us about 20 to 30 minutes to take these devices out. Um, there's been no complications related to the actual removal. The anatomy is not significantly altered or changed. And we've even done Nissen fund application at the same time as removal of the device. The worldwide experience with the Lynx right now has been about over 2,100 have been implanted worldwide. Follow-up now is out to about seven and a half years. There have been no procedural complications. The reversal rate or need to explant or remove the device has been hanging around two and a half to three percent. Half of those have been for persistent difficulty swallowing. The other half have been for persistent reflux symptoms. There have been no migrations of the device. There have been three erosions for an overall very low erosion rate of around 0.2%. So who is the Lynx candidate? Is everybody a candidate for the Lynx? Well, I mean, what we've seen at our center is really it seems to be the younger patients. Um, they're very internet savvy. They seem to know more about the Lynx than I do, and they seem to know more about me than my wife does. They also seem to be more of the mild to moderate reflux patient. They tend to have smaller hiatal hernias. They either have no reflux esophagitis or very mild forms of esophagitis. They've got normal strength or motility of their esophagus, and they're moderately well controlled on PPIs.
they're really sort of the generation Y. They don't really want to be inconvenienced by the occasional breakthrough symptom, nor do they want to be inconvenienced by the need to take a medication on a daily basis. And so for me and for us, the Lynx patient has really been in that 30 to 40 percent that were not completely satisfied with their medications. Either they were having breakthrough symptoms or they just simply don't want to be on a daily medication to treat their reflux. So for us, it's really been a simple, a safe procedure that clearly stops reflux, normalizing pH, getting patients off their medications and making patients feel better. The biggest benefit is that it's without the side effects of the Nissen fund application, the gas, the bloating, the inability to belch and vomit. And so my final proposal in all of this is really just to stop shopping in this section of the pharmacy. This is the fastest rising section of any section in the pharmacy. And it's really not doing anything to help stop the progression of this disease. Again, reflux continues on medications, like I showed you, and I think there's good evidence to suggest it's being pushed by the bile. The medications aren't doing anything to address the bile, and so we can't expect them to change this progression. So again, just to drive it home, I mean, reflux is a disorder of that valve, the sphincter. It's as simple as that. It's a, it's a plumbing problem. You've got a, a weak valve at the end of your esophagus. It has nothing to do with the acid in your stomach. The treatment is really to fix the valve. That's what's providing a barrier against reflux. If you have a weak valve, you're going to have reflux. It's as simple as that, on or off medications. So again, the problem is the valve. And so the solution is to fix the valve, whether that be with the Lynx or the Nissen, both of which will fix it. But something needs to be done to stop the progression.